Okay, maybe it's working now. It was saying that I wasn't live on YouTube and I've been talking for like five minutes. Okay, I think we got the glitch figured out now. So I'm answering a question that somebody asked about, uh, which is how could I get people to accept me as someone who has a disability? So, and what I was saying that not everybody will, not everybody has love for others. Not everybody has compassion. And a lot of times it's because they don't have love and compassion for themselves. So it's got to start within you, you loving and accepting yourself is the number one place and that will vibrate and emanate out of you. So <clears throat> do you notice it's a different experience you have of people when you run into someone who's got confidence, someone who really loves themselves. How you experience them and what they put out into the world is 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 just so much stronger and like just it it's it's a different level of people feel secure around you when you have peace and love for yourself. <clears throat> If you don't love yourself and you're feeling bad about yourself or you're feeling down on yourself, um, other people can pick up on that. For instance, you've heard of a, like a terminology called victim mentality. If you go around like, I'm not worthy, I'm a victim, people don't treat me good, you, you, you carry something around that kind of emanates and you start to get more of the same thing. So more people will treat you badly the more you focus on being a victim and having people treat you badly. I hope that makes sense. When you carry yourself, when you love yourself and you're carrying yourself like, I love myself and it doesn't matter what anyone thinks of me, you're going to have more people gravitate towards you and love you more and be kind to you more because you're first being that to yourself. So I guess what I'm trying to say is whatever you want to have in your life, <clears throat> you have to work on becoming that first. Once you have that within you, you're, you're basically setting the example of how you want others to treat you. So if you're not treating yourself in a nice, kind, respectful, loving manner, then you're setting the tone for how other people treat you. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> Wonderful. So I'm looking at the questions. Um, the best, the best place to ask me questions that I'll actually see them is on my YouTube channel or on, in my private Facebook group, Purpose Driven Christians. Um, I'll try to look at some of the ones on Instagram, but I may not always see them because they come in really fast. Okay. So, <clears throat> hey, Brittany. Hey, Nana. Hey, Angela. Hey, Vias. Derek. <clears throat> Derek asks, why haven't you replied to my text? Well, Derek, I don't always reply to all my texts. Also, I wasn't sure of the nature of, of what you were asking me. So <clears throat> sometimes when I'm not sure how to respond, I don't respond. So when you send me a text like, when can we get together? And you're not telling me what it's for, what's the purpose, and I'm working six days a week, um, barely have any time with my family. And then I have someone who I know who wants to get together, but they don't tell me why they don't tell me for what purpose they like, I'm not even the type of person that gets together with my friends, even maybe three or four times a year max. So <clears throat> with all that I do in my life and my busy schedule, it's just not, I just don't like go randomly hang out with people. That's something I did in my twenties, but as a busy mom who works full time and has multiple other side jobs and side hustles plus family, I just, I just didn't, I just don't go hang out with people. And, you know, so hopefully that's, hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from. <clears throat> and see that that's just not, I just don't like, hey, let's hang out. I have a girlfriend that I'm supposed to be getting together with, hopefully in a couple of weeks. We've been trying to get together for like six months. I haven't seen her in like a year and a half. So um, I just don't like, 
go hang out with people and chill. I, I just don't have time for that in my life, in the season that I'm in right now, right? Raising kids and doing all the things, you know, maybe, maybe that will change if I ever decide to retire. I don't know. So hopefully you understand where I'm coming from and you don't feel hurt about that because it's not personal. It's not about you. Uh, Nicola asks what, oh, you know what? I found a new feature that puts the comments uh, on YouTube and Facebook on the screen. Look at that. Can you guys see that on YouTube? I just figured this out last week. Is that cool that I can, <clears throat> can type in the chat box if you can see the questions. All right. What's your hobby besides acting and coaching? I would say it's writing poetry. That would be, that would be my hobby. Okay. Next question. Ah, okay. Helene, is it Helene? I don't feel like people expect who I am and boys in my school are bullying me and saying I'm ugly and I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I would want to ask you, first of all, does it matter that somebody thinks you're ugly? Because honestly, it's just their opinion. That doesn't make it the truth. I know it hurts to have people call you names. That's awful. And I also want to ask you, have you told the principal, have you told your teachers that you're getting bullied? So I know th this is this is a tough one because sometimes letting the authorities know that you're being bullied sometimes makes it better, but other times it makes it worse. But <clears throat> here's what I've noticed. When I get hurt by certain things people say, that a lot of times has to do with me not feeling good about myself and me believing what they say. So if someone telling me that I'm ugly hurts me, that sometimes means that deep down you're feeling that way about yourself. And like I answered the other person, the first place you got to show that love is to yourself. The first place you got to have respect is to yourself. So you have to really be secure in who you are, where it's almost like whatever they say, it just bounces off you and falls to the ground. You don't take it in, right? That's why the scripture says we have a shield of faith. When you're holding your shield of faith up, you're not letting the fiery darts of the enemy get into your heart and pierce you. If, if something people are saying is hurting you, <clears throat> then you're not being protected, right? You don't have that shield of faith up. Faith in who you are, faith that you are a child of God and no one can take that away from you. Faith that you are important, that you are here for a purpose, that you were made on purpose for a purpose and there's a design for you. You know, sometimes people tend to pick on who they feel is, is the, for lack of better terms, the weakest link right? If they see like an animal who's been hurt, they'll hurt it more or kick it more. If, if you're not walking around confident in who you are and whose you are as a child of the most high God, then sometimes that leaves you open, right? And the devil is evil, right? He's, he does not care if you're a child, if you're wounded or whatever. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, that will make him want to pick on you more. So he's always whispering to people, sending people across your path to cause harm, to hurt you, to do things. And here's the thing. He knows exactly what your triggers are. He knows what your triggers are because he's been around for thousands of years studying human nature. The devil is not stronger than us and he's not smarter than us. I mean, as far as... He's smarter in the in the fact that he's been around longer studying mankind. So he knows how to trigger us. So if we have the mind of Christ and we put the mind of Christ on, right? We're wearing the breastplate of righteousness. We've got our shield of faith. We've got the sword of the spirit. So if all that's like foreign terminology to you, I would suggest that you read Ephesians chapter six in your Bible that talks about putting on the full armor. So what it's like, it's almost like every day we leave our house, we're going out into a battlefield. Whenever you're going to school, whenever you're going to work, whenever you're leaving the sanctuary in peace of your home, it's, it's a battlefield because not everybody out in the world loves God, loves the Lord, 
is going to treat you kindly. Even those who, who do love the Lord, we make mistakes. Sometimes we have bad days. We get grumpy. We sometimes say things we shouldn't. We need to apologize. But there's, it's, it's like there's a battle going on, right? There's always good versus evil. That's the law of polarity, right? There's always going to be opposite. So for every kind person, there might be a mean person. It's focusing on, it's you know, really focusing on the goodness and kindness. And when, when the bullying comes, really draw close to those who do love you, who do take care of you, who are kind to you. And try not to put your focus on those who don't get you, who don't love you, who don't accept you. And if you can get to the point where, you know, it's, do you remember, is it just me? Or did you guys have like this saying growing up that you would say, when someone said something mean to you and you'd say, I'm rubber and you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. You almost have to become, you know, it's, it's, it's a silly childhood little nursery rhyme thing we would say. But if you could take on that, you know, perception of like, I am rubber. I'm going to, whatever they say is going to bounce off me and it's going to stick with them because truly these bullies, you almost have to feel sorry for them. Imagine, I, I know if you're in a place right now where you're feeling being victimized and it's hurting, but if you can if you can look at the psychology of what these bullies are going through, they don't feel good about themselves. They might be being bullied too at home, so they're gonna go pick on, on someone else. It's like the guy that gets fired from his job and he's so angry, so he goes home and kicks the dog. He's trying to take it out on someone else. A lot of times these bullies are being bullied and they're trying to take it out on you. Now, this may be some unconventional wisdom, but loving, like showing love and kindness to the bully, asking the bully, like, are you OK? You know, um, you got to be in the right mental place, though. You got to be in the right place. You got to be prayed up. You got to, you know, be asking God, give me the wisdom. What do I say to this person? How do I react in this situation? But a lot of times these bullies are people who've been really hurt in life and they're just trying to deal with their own stuff. They're projecting it onto you because they're so hurt. They're so wounded. They're so broken. And they don't know how to get rid of this like heavy stuff they're carrying. So they shove it on you. So if you can think of it almost like the bully, the mean person in life is carrying a stack of boxes. These boxes are so heavy and they see you and you're not carrying around a lot of junk and baggage. And so they take some of these boxes and they try to force it on you. You carry this. And this is the words, the meanness, the bullying, the punching, the insults. But you know what? You can drop the boxes at any moment. You can say, I don't have to carry that. That's your mess. That's your heaviness. I'm not going to carry that. And you let go of the insults. You let go of them calling you ugly, making fun of your looks or your weight or your size or your smarts or whatever it is. And you just drop the boxes and you let it go. You don't let that pierce your shield of faith. You don't let it mean anything about you because what people speak is a projection of how they feel about themselves and how they don't like their life. And there's some things that they don't like about themselves and they're pushing that out on you. Okay. So you can choose at any moment to let it go, drop the boxes. Just imagine that name they called you ugly, whatever other names they called you. That's just a box. They are trying to hand off on you. Drop it. Let it go. Don't carry it around. Hope that was helpful to you. All right, let's see the next question. If you guys on Instagram want to ask me a question, I would say hop on the YouTube channel if you're not already in my private group, Purpose Driven Christians. All right. <clears throat> Saheed says, Catherine, I need advice and I want to know is I have fake friends in my life but it's really hard to stop being their friend. So do you have any tips for me to use? So when I've had fake friends in my life, the good thing is you've identified who they are. They, they usually show, they're usually pretty easy to see who they are. 
depending on it's really time reveals itself and you can see who's real and who's fake. What I would do is if I know somebody's a fake friend, I'm kind of friends from afar. I kind of keep my distance from them. Um, I don't try to like make a purpose to hang out with them or engage with them. Um, I definitely don't call them. I definitely don't text them. If they text or, you know, call me, I'll, I'll be pleasant. But when I know that they're not really true friends or they're trying to get something out of me or they're being fake, I don't, I don't consider them friends. I kind of, they be kind of move to the acquaintance category. Like I know them, I'm praying for them. Like I hope they can get, get it together, but I don't engage. Um, so don't engage, you know, if they invite you to a party, you know, you really got it. This is where prayer and discernment really comes in. Lord, do you want me to go to this party? Is there a reason I should go? Is there somebody there you want me to meet? Is there somebody you want me to talk to or share your gospel with? How, how do I react in this situation? But a lot of times when you stand in integrity and you are being true to who you are. Yeah, there's going to be some people that come and try to take you down or there's going to be some people like if if you're successful they're going to want to ride your coattails. They're going to want like they're going to want you to drag them to success with them. But I just think the fact that you know who these people are, that would make me just want to kind of take a step back and just pray for them cuz you don't know what their motives are. And they could be planning something not good. They could be planning something to take you down or to hurt you. I know it's hard when you're a loving person. It's hard to think that there's people um, in your life that would be like that. But there are simply because, you know, like I mentioned, the law of polarity, there's good and there's evil. And, and there's always both. And, you know, in different videos, I've mentioned, you know, we're all God's children and blah, blah, blah. And God loves us all. And though it's true that God loves us all, you know, after more careful reading of the scripture, I realized we are not all God's children. So what do I mean by that? Yes, he created us all. Yes, he loves us all. Yes, he would love for us to be his children. But even Jesus talks about um, certain people in the Bible. He talked about you are a, you are a child of your father, the devil. The devil is the father of lies. And and he, and he there's different parts of the scriptures where it talks about if you do this certain thing, you act a certain way, then you're just like your father, the devil, who was a liar since the beginning of time. So people choose, although God made us all and God loves us all, sometimes people choose by their actions, by their beliefs, to side with the devil more than God, to be a child of the devil more than to be a child of God. Maybe that's shocking for some of you to hear, but that's what people do and that's what people choose. And sometimes there's going to be people who are listening to the devil, who do not have your best interest in mind, who want to hurt you either because they're hurting so much or because they're listening to the wrong voices. You know, you think of the people that go into buildings and start shooting people up. They could say that they're uh, a child of God, but their actions are proving otherwise. So we are not what we say. We're what we do, right? So there's a, also a scripture that says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So there may be people going around saying, oh, I'm a child of God, I'm a Christian, I'm this, but their actions are the actions of the evil one, of the devil, then, then, then they're not, right? The scripture tells us we shall know them by their fruit. So what kind of fruit are they putting out in the world? Is it diseased? Is it moldy? Is it full of bugs? Or is it sweet and juicy and life-giving? That's important for you to note. So when you think of your friends and you're wondering, which of my friends are my true friends? Look at the fruit they produce. Think of them as a tree. And would you eat the fruit that they're producing? And also think about this. We become like the five people we spend the most time with. Are the people that you're spending the most time with the people you want to become like? If not, you might want to change your friend circle. Next question from Tom W. 1983. What are you going to do in the future? Well, 
Um, I hope to write more books. I hope to be speaking on stages, doing motivational talks. I hope to make enough money to retire my husband and have like a family business where we all work together with the kids. I don't know how any of those things are going to play out, but that's, that's my hope for the future. <laughs> okay. Looking at your questions. Okay. Ah, is it Krisha? Krisha, can I try to fit myself to the group that I don't belong? I don't think so. And I think that kind of piggybacks on what we were just talking about. Who do you want to become like? If you already know there's a group where you don't belong and you want to try to fit yourself in, why? I would start asking myself, why? Why do I want to belong to that? What do I feel like I'm missing in me where I feel like I want to try to shove myself into places I don't really fit? Is there some, do you have any kind of, is there some loneliness you're dealing with? Is there some where you're not feeling good about yourself and you're wanting other people's validation? The validation you really need would be validation from God and validation you get from yourself and those you love and care about. We should not be trying to get validation from groups of people that we don't like, who don't, who aren't a good influence on us, who don't believe the things that we believe. We have to stop reaching out for the praises of mankind and for people who don't like us, because then, then we'll end up doing things that we regret. We'll end up doing things we wished we didn't do. Um, just to fit in some group, to have someone want, you know, to make us feel better, like we belong. But at the end of the day, what is it within you that you need to get right with, that you need to get secure about, that you need to feel good about yourself? And starting to love yourself for who you are as the unique creation and contribution that you are to the world. You know, I would suggest you start a gratitude journal and start writing down all the things that you're grateful for and all the things that you love about yourself. When you start to see your value, when you start to see all the things you have going for you, and sometimes that might be hard to figure out. Well, this is an exercise I occasionally sometimes give to some of my coaching clients is to write down all the things they love about themselves. And sometimes it's really hard for them to come up with them because they've spent their whole life thinking negatively about themselves. But the more you get in tune, that used to be so hard for me. And I couldn't think of a single thing to write down. And but I've grown so much in who I am and who I know myself to be as a child of God. But the last time someone gave me this exercise about a year ago, I like people were I saw people that were like racking their brain. And they're like, I, they couldn't think of anything to write. And I was like, I was writing so much that I'm grateful for, that I that I like about myself, that I ran out of paper because they gave us this like brochure and they had like six six spots. And I think at like I was like writing on the back and underneath and on this side and in these. I was it's so much. It's so much. And if you really get clear on who you are and love yourself, you're gonna find so much that you're so grateful for that you love about yourself, you're too gonna run out of paper. And that's how it should be. And, and I think sometimes as, as, you know, when you're a believer, when you believe in God, sometimes we get mixed up about what humility is. And we think in order to be humble, that we can't find our good traits, that we can't think good things about ourselves, that we have to just be a doormat. And that's, that's not what the scripture means at all. There's a scripture that says, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought. Well, that doesn't mean to think more lowly of yourself than you ought, right? So you you it's okay to know your good traits. It's okay to be aware, just like you're aware of the areas that you maybe need work, that you maybe need help. You know, like I know I'm I can be a clutter bug. I know I have messes. I know I'm not an organized person. You know, do you see how we can easily name all these things we're not good at? I'm not good at sports. I'm not good at like but you should be able to just as easily be able to name all these things that you are good at. Like, I'm good at doing my makeup. I'm good at finding cute clothes at the thrift store. I'm good at, you know, um, cheering people up. I'm good at having, teaching people a different perspective. 
Um, I'm good at making people feel valued, whatever it is. And it can even be, it can even be like superficial things. Like I can say, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good writer. Sometimes I'm good at writing poetry. Sometimes I'm good at putting a, an outfit together. Sometimes I do my makeup and I think, wow, I look really cute today. And that's not, that's not like an egocentric thing. That's like showing appreciation for who you are. So it may seem unrelated, but when you can appreciate and love who you are, then you're not so eager to get into groups to want to belong and be approved of by people where you don't belong. Does that make sense? Okay. Next question we have on YouTube. Lynn says, hi, from the Philippines. Do you have I do have a question about confidence. What's the best way to boost your confidence, especially if I'm a plus size teenager? Thank you. Okay. All right. So confidence is, is, it's really irrelevant of what your outside, what, what the outside is. Okay. It doesn't matter if you're plus size. It doesn't matter if you have 10,000 pimples. It doesn't matter what anything on the outside. Confidence has to come from within, has to come from within you. I get my confidence uh, a lot of times reading what the scripture has to say about me and how much God loves me and how he made me the way he made me for a future and a hope to give me a purpose. And really our outside is so irrelevant. And sometimes we think, well, if I don't look like these other people, then I have to feel bad about myself. I have to cover myself up. I have to hide. And that's just not true. When you love you, it exudes. You know, I've seen, I have a friend who I talk about this in my You Are Worthy book and my online course, You Are Worthy, about how the outside is irrelevant. It has nothing to do with your true worth and who you really are. This is available on Amazon for anybody who want to get a copy of it. Um, once you know your true worth and that you are worthy, it's completely irrelevant what you look like on the outside. So I have a friend who she looks like she could be on the cover of like Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Magazine. She is so insecure. She does not like herself. She's had, I don't know, probably, I'm just guessing, hundreds of thousands of dollars in plastic surgery because she doesn't like herself. Whenever you give her a compliment, she's always putting herself down or saying, oh, yeah, but look, I got to get this fixed or this isn't right or I'm this or I've gained weight or I'm flabby. I need, like, she's like, size two. And she's complaining about being flabby. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying is it's, it's irrelevant. What you look like on the outside is completely irrelevant. So when I hated myself, when I had no confidence, when I thought I was hideous and ugly and disgusting and that no one would want to be my friend, I was like 30 pounds lighter and 20 years younger. So you could, so if you really think it's about the outside, you've got to realize it's not. I love myself more. I'm more confident now at this older age, at this heavier weight than I ever was when I had it going for me on the outside, right? Because it's not about the outside. It's about how you feel about yourself. So you can decide from this moment on, I am perfect just the way I am. This is this is the body I have and I'm going to love it. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to cover it up. I'm not going to cower in the corner. I'm not going to suck in my stomach when someone comes by. I'm going to be a vessel of love and I'm going to show love and I'm going to give love despite what anybody else might be thinking or feeling because confidence can only come from you. If you're looking for validation from the outside or wanting people to say, oh, you're, you're, you're great. You're the, it's, it's hollow and it's shallow and it doesn't last because people's opinions, they come and go. And a lot of times, most of the time, it's not even based on the truth. What people think about you is also irrelevant because they could be having a bad day. They could be saying something mean and nasty. And sometimes you'll see like 
people who are plus size and and maybe you need to get some more plus size mentors who someone who's got that confidence that swagger that love of themselves that love of their curves who can show you it, it's not about your size so ask yourself some questions about what is it on the inside i too used to like you know if you're insecure about your size i used to be too i would show i would go to auditions and i would be with these girls that were like these perfect barbie girls and they were size zero i had never even heard of a size zero like i don't think there was size zeros in minnesota <laughs> like i never met any till i moved to la and i was a size 10 and they were like oh my god you're huge you know it's other people's opinions so i wrote about this hold on for those of you who have this book poetic prescriptions for eternal youth this is really about examining earthly beauty from a heavenly perspective what is it about ourselves do we need to get all this work done do we need to fix ourselves up i want to give you lynn and anyone listening a free copy of this book because it's going to help you come to terms with who you really are so if you want to get this if someone could write this in the chat um free um oh wait the website is Poetic Prescriptions, just like it's spelled here, poeticprescriptions.com forward slash free book. You guys can all download a copy of this. If you're struggling with how you look or how you feel about yourself, download this book for free and read it. I want to get you guys some freedom around that topic. Poeticprescriptions.com forward slash free book. And one of the one of the poems I wrote in here, I'm going to share with you. It's called Earth Suit Envy. So it's about how I used to be jealous of like supermodels and how they look. And then, well, I'll share it with you. Earth Suit Envy. With supermodels, I'm obsessed for they possess je ne sais quoi. Those walking hangers are so blessed of raw willpower, I'm in awe. Like lollipops with bobbing heads, crunch salary till I've no mind. Wish hot couture my daily threads, but that catwalk has left me blind. Forgot this earth's a pop-up shop, this garb's a temporary tent, and even if my clothes were swapped, this coat I wear is just for rent. So what do I mean by that? So I'm talking about our bodies on earth, these clothes we wear. We are speaking spirits. We are spirits having this earthly experience. We came down from the Father. God placed us in these bodies. These bodies are not us, right? I talk about this a lot in my You Are Worthy book and course. These, these bodies are just a vehicle that we're using to get around on earth. So if it starts falling apart, if it's bigger than other people's vehicles, if it's got more wrinkles, you know, think of it like a car. It's, as long as it's getting you from point A to point B for you to accomplish your purpose in life, it doesn't matter what it looks like. You can get it buffed out. You can get it nipped and tucked and sucked and whatever. Dolly Parton's famous quote, if I see it sagging, bagging, or dragging, I get it nipped, tucked, or sucked. And it's not that doing any uh, cosmetic procedures or diet, it's not that any dieting, it's not that it's wrong, but it's not going to fix how you feel about yourself. And it's not going to give you the confidence you need. Because like I said, I have a friend that has spent probably over 100000 on cosmetic procedures and she still doesn't love herself. Right. So those those airbrush babes are photoshopped. I hadn't used my spiritual eyes comparing how my flab does flop. I pined for cellulite free thighs with cover girls. I can't compare. And yet my spouse didn't make remarks. He doesn't care what size I wear. This curvy girl still gives him sparks. Our faux pas and our overwhelm are human. We're judged by our appearance. Aren't we of supernatural realm? These two confused cause interference. So what do I mean by that? We're of a supernatural realm. We're not, we're not of this earth, right? Maybe you guys have seen bumper stickers that says, not of this world. 
So we get confused when we think we are the body we live in. We're not. We are a spirit. I, I have an advanced course coming out. You are worthy level two. It's finally being edited and a book coming out called So I'm Worthy, Now What? And I talk about the three parts of us. So we are a spirit. We have a soul. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And we live in a body. So don't, don't get confused. You are a spirit who has a soul, who lives in a body. You are not your body. So if you start thinking of yourself, not as your body, like think of it as a separate thing. Like my vehicle is outside. When I get off this live stream today, I'm going to get in my vehicle and go to work. I am the important thing, not the vehicle. You as your spirit are the important thing, not your vehicle. So if your vehicle is getting rusty, if it's getting wrinkles, if it's losing hair, if it's turning gray, if it's getting you to your destination, to where God wants you from point A to point B, it's irrelevant what this earth suit looks like. And even at church, my thoughts get caught, snagged on regalia, not the higher, on pastor's dress and not what's taught, eyeballing clothes worn by the choir. Eventually, these shapes, our bodies, will die. We'll drop this sheath and go on living. Our spirit soon will leap and fly. That's where attention should be given. I'm not saying it's wrong to mend an outfit that has wear and tear, but appliques and latest trends won't really get you anywhere. What am I talking about? Okay, well, first of all, it was trendy like in the 90s and 2000s to get boob jobs. And it was trendy to get your waist tucked in and ribs removed. And then now it's trendy to get like these butt lifts or butt whatever things people put in to make their butts big, whatever it is. You know, if you want to do that kind of stuff, fine. But if you're thinking that's the solution for how terrible you feel about yourself, it's not. Because as soon as you do it, you're going to find something else that needs to be fixed that's not good enough. It's a never-ending race when you're trying to keep up with the outside appearance. And it's, it's what's on the inside that counts. It sounds cliche. But if you don't love yourself now where you're at, you're not going to love yourself when, when you lose 40 pounds, if you don't love yourself now, you won't love yourself then, right? Because you can, you can probably imagine back to a time where you were smaller and you didn't love yourself. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's irrelevant. We can nip tuck the skin we're in, but may I say the point is moot? Too soon. It's just a place we've been because it's only an earth suit. We're only on this earth for such a limited time. And if we're wasting any seconds of our day feeling bad about our vehicle, feeling bad about our car, I'm going to purposely keep calling it your vehicle and your car so you can detach yourself from it being you. You are not your body. You have one just so you can get around on earth to do the things you need to do. Okay. I hope that was helpful for you. All right, so I'm looking for more questions. Oh, thank you guys for the love. Okay. Okay, I've answered that question. Okay, I'm not sure if I understand this one. You said that you were very strong previously. Did you get your strength back? I don't know if that's referring to physically. I used to be stronger. <laughs> And then I had the surgery when I had my last child and they sliced my belly open, sliced me up. And then I feel like I haven't been as strong since, but I'm not sure if that's even what you're talking about. So, okay. I, I'm getting stronger. I joined a gym a couple months ago. Um, I think in January or February, I joined a gym and, um, I am doing my best to get my strength back. I gave myself a goal. I told my trainer at the gym my goal is that by October, my birthday, that I can do one pull-up. Strength, strength goal. I didn't have a weight goal. I didn't have a size goal. I had a strength goal because, like, the rest is irrelevant. I want to be strong. Okay, I'm looking for your questions. Uh, let's.
let's see. Some of you guys are asking the same question over and over. Nicola, thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate you. Okay, let's see. Brittany is asking, what are you and your family doing for Easter? Um, we may do some like Easter arts and crafts. We may hide some eggs around in the yard with little prizes and for the kids. We're definitely going to church. Rob is going to be serving in the children's ministry for the first time. So that'll be nice. I'm bringing a friend to church. We'll probably go out to lunch after. Okay, Elwad asks, what's your favorite thing to cook for your kids? Um, hmm. We kind of we kind of like making pancakes together. That's one of the fun things we do together. Okay. Let's see. Uh Nicola asks, do you consider yourself to be more extroverted or introverted? I'm definitely more introverted. But because of my calling on my life, I have to choose to operate <laughs> as an extrovert. So you can kind of tell if you're an introvert or an extrovert by how you feel around people. I have friends who are true extroverts. They're around people. They get energized by being around people. When I'm around people too, mu too much, I get drained. I get drained. And introverts need to pull away from everyone and kind of refuel themselves. That's me. I have to like, I could be out there doing my thing at conferences, speaking, da, 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 but then like, I just want to go to my room and shut the door and like, leave me alone for 12 hours. Whereas extroverts would be like after the conference, Hey, you guys want to go hang out? You want to go to a club? You want to go party? You want to go to a dance? And I'll be like, no, I need to, I need some downtime. I need to get away. Um, so that's kind of how you can tell if you're an introvert or an extrovert. It's not what you do, because if you just look at what I do as a speaker and an actor and a coach, that seems like an extrovert, but um, I'm an introvert who's got extrovert jobs, <laughs> which can be draining. Okay. Uh, let's see. Porcupine. I get bullied every day of school. I'm not like the other kids. Can you explain this whole thing? We did kind of talk about the bullying already. And, but as far as you're not like the other kids, I would say good, good for you. Thank goodness you are not like the other kids. You're not supposed to be. You're not meant to be. Please do not try to fit in. You, you know, the scripture calls us set apart. He says, we are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. You should stick out. That's a good thing. As long as you're sticking out for the right reasons. You don't want to stick out because you're like mean or a jerk, right? As long as you're sticking out for the right reasons. Sticking out, you know, maybe your friends are going to parties and maybe you're sticking out because you're saying, no, I'm not going to play spin the bottle. I'm not going to kiss some weird random people. Maybe you're sticking up. You're saying, no, I'm not going to drink alcohol. I'm not going to do drugs. Those are good reasons to stick out and not fit in. You don't have to go with the crowd. Even if everybody is doing it, you don't want to go with the crowd if the crowd is going in the wrong direction. Sometimes we can get roped into, um, making fun of other people because we're with a group and they are judgy. They're gossipy. They make fun of other people. And you can stick out if you go, I'm not going to participate in this. I'm not going to be putting other people down or judging other people. Okay. So hopefully that was helpful. Danny asks, why does job hunting so hard? What does job hunting so hard? Okay. So why is it so hard? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with your mindset, which is almost everything has to do with mindset. If you think it's hard, it's going to be hard. And sometimes you have to start changing how you think about it. So hopefully you're getting, you're getting yourself the education you need. You're watching videos on how to be successful. Hopefully you're reading books on how to find a job, um, scouring the internet on articles on how to find a job. But if you, if you tell yourself it's hard, 
then it's going to become hard. You're going to, it's, you're going to only look for the hard things to do. But I don't know if you guys saw a couple of weeks ago, I was holding up this little sign that said, what if it were easy? I want you to start thinking about um, what if it were easy? What if it were easy for me to find a job? What if finding a job just came naturally to me? What if everywhere I went, I just got offered jobs, great jobs, jobs I'd love to have. And you start changing your mindset, you're going to start seeing these things opening up for you. You're going to start seeing that those those thoughts, once you start really thinking them, because right now what happens is, is the way our brains work, they kind of are, they're kind of programmed to look for and find whatever we're saying, whatever our subconscious believes, your brain will go to work trying to make that true. It's it's like you guys have heard me say this before. I forget what it's called, but there's there's a, there's a term for it. Like when you get a certain kind of car, suddenly you see those cars everywhere. Well, when you get a certain idea in your mind, like all men are jerks or finding a job is hard, you're going to start running across jerky men and hard so hard to find a job. But if you can change your tune and you can start saying, wow, it's so easy to find a job. Finding a job comes easy for me. Everywhere I go, people are offering me good paying jobs. And and you start to you start to just confess that and think that and believe that. And and you're gonna start your your mind will start looking for the easy ways to find jobs instead of the hard ways to find jobs. A lot of what we do is based on what we say in our programming, right? That's why scripture says, um, if you believe it, you can have it. I'm trying to think of, I'm thinking like a four scriptures all at once, but you don't have because you don't ask, right? So we have to ask God, show me how to find jobs in an easy way. Show me how to get a job and show me the easy ways to get the job. Show me all the paths that make it easy to get a job. Because once you start looking for something, you'll start finding it. Okay, you probably have seen many examples of people in your life that have uh, things wrong. I mean, things wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I was reading another question. Um, you, you'll find people that they they have a certain way of thinking. And, and it comes true for them. Like, so, like I knew someone, they were like, I've got great parking karma. I was like, what's that? They're like, everywhere I go, I always find a great parking spot. Well, why do they always find a great parking spot everywhere they go? Because they believe they're going to find a great parking spot everywhere they go, right? If you can believe it, you can achieve it. If you can believe it, you can have it. The scripture is very big on faith and belief. So you have to start believing, you know, get familiar with the scriptures you know, God says, whatever we put our hands to will prosper. He says he wants to give us the desires of our heart. And he says he wants to work all things out for our good. If you start believing that and looking for it, you'll start having it. It'll start coming to you, but you got to believe it. Okay. So Missy Edge says, do you believe people are going to hell for piercings or tattoos? A Christian told me I was. No, I don't believe that. There's nothing. Uh, that's that's kind of not what that's doesn't have anything to do with it. That doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven or going to hell. What you do with this earth suit has nothing to do with going to heaven or going to hell. Right? We go to heaven if he, he, here's the thing. When you believe in God. And you realize, I have done wrong things in my life, like we all have, right? Romans 3.23 says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you recognize, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I've done some things wrong. And I need God's help, right? So you recognize your need for God. You recognize you can't do it on your own. And you recognize God sent his son to die for you, right? When he sent his son to die for you, his blood was like the sacrificial sacrifice. Back in the Old Testament, when they did something wrong or they would sin, they would sacrifice an animal and the blood was like the atoning. It atoned for what we've done wrong, right? It was, it was um, 
something that covered our sins or transgressions. Well, now Jesus did that once and for all. We don't have to sacrifice for sin anymore. So you realize I've, I've messed up in my life. I know God died for me and I want to accept him into my heart and I want to confess that he is the Lord and I need his help in my life. It says you will be saved when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of God, you will be saved. So it doesn't say unless you have some tattoos, unless you have some piercings, unless you have never cheated on a test, unless you have not committed adultery, unless you lie, unless like there's all these things that we do wrong, that we, we cheat, we steal, we lie, we think bad thoughts, right? It's not even just about like murdering someone. When Jesus came, he said, if you even look at your brother with hate, you've committed murder in your heart. So really all these exterior things are also kind of like, it's not going to make or break your relationship with God or getting into heaven. Now, if you did something that, you know, anytime you do sin, you ask God to forgive you, you repent of it, you turn and go the other way, right? Repentance is a full 180 turn. If you are going this way, down the wrong path, headed towards sin, you say, God, I'm sorry. You repent and you start to go the right way. You start to go the right way with God. Okay. Here's where people get into trouble. They are heading towards sin, heading towards sin, going the wrong way, living a bad life. Did it. God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And they keep heading there. They keep heading there. They keep heading towards sin. They don't stop and make that change, right? Because scripture tells us those who love me keep my commandments. So you can't say, I love God as I'm heading to sin. I'm heading to sin. I'm doing all the things the scripture tells me not to do, but I love God. Please forgive me as I'm going the opposite direction of what you say. No, repentance is turning and now going the right direction. Once the Holy Spirit convicts you, you turn and go the right direction. Now, any, any piercings or tattoos you get in the future, maybe you want to pray about it. I don't know. Maybe you want to ask God, should I do this? You know, I think, I think the more we involve God in our decisions and the things that we want to do, the, the better it's going to be for us, you know, because God loves us and he wants to protect us. And when you go say, should I go over to XYZ tattoo shop, and get a tattoo? And he tells you, no, we got to respect that because he knows all. He knows the end. He knows the beginning. He knows the middle. And he may know that. XYZ tattoo shop doesn't clean their needles and you may get AIDS from something, you know, I'm just, I'm just making up a scenario. But the point is whenever God tells you no, it's because he loves you and he wants to protect you and he wants what's best for you. So those of you who maybe don't know what, it, what it's like to have a relationship with God and you've never done that, you're like, I know about God, but I'm not a hundred percent sure what, like, what do I do? Here's the thing. You no, if you know that you haven't done everything right and you're not perfect and we can't get into heaven on our own, if you just believe in your heart that, and you believe in your heart that God loves you and he sent his son to die for you and raised him from the dead, and you believe that and you confess it, you, you, you can go to heaven. So I would just say everyone on here right now who isn't sure, pray this prayer with me. We're just going to say a simple prayer. Just say it after me. Heavenly Father, I love you and I know I need you. Thank you, God, for sacrificing your son for my sins. I'm asking you right now to please forgive me for everything that I've ever done wrong. And I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Cover me with, cover me with the blood of Jesus to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. And I'm asking you today to come into my heart and be with me in the name of Jesus. Amen. And then you start and then you stop what you're doing and you start heading towards God. And whenever you get thrown off course, you remember, God, help me, help me turn and go the right way. And then you start heading the right way. It's not as complicated as everybody makes it out to be. And you pray to God every day and you tune into him and you ask him for, for whatever you need. And he loves to give it to you. 
Scripture tells us in Proverbs, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Maybe I should do a, a live stream teaching about why sometimes our prayers don't get answered. I don't know if that would be helpful. Okay, next question. What do you do in the morning to start off on a positive day? Is there something you do throughout the day to keep you grounded? I love to start my mornings in prayer, in reading, in, in writing. Um, I have a prayer journal. I write down my gratitude, uh, things I'm grateful for. I write down my concerns, the things that are on my mind. I pray. I read the scriptures. Sometimes I'm reading other books. I'm learning. That, for me, helps start my day on a positive note. And then when my kids wake up, I got to get my hugs in. I always start my day with lemon water. Lately, I've been, looks a little fuzzy. I've been starting with lemon water mixed with coriander, coriander seed powder to help flush toxins out of the body. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. What What's going to energize you? What's going to start your day off right? Um, I realize, boy, oh, we got another question. Can I assist you with anything? Also, do you have plans to see Mel Novak this weekend? I am not going to see Mel Novak this weekend. Um, can you assist me with anything? I don't know. I would definitely have to think about that. Um, Angela, thank you so much for the super sticker. I totally appreciate you, especially knowing the situation you're in right now and the sacrifice that is for you. Oh, Nira. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are so generous and kind. And I really, you know, I appreciate you being here and feeling like you're that feeling like you're getting anything out of um, being with me today and being part of this community. And I wish I had time to answer every single person's question. Um, but we usually only go for an hour. So please come back uh, next week. We're going to do this every Saturday, not the Q and A's, but I'll be teaching next week on um, how to beat procrastination again and how to actually achieve your goals. And the week after that, I have a special treat for you. I have a friend who wrote a beautiful book on loss. So if you've lost anyone, if you have lost a loved one, she's going to be on with me the week after that, showing you how to have hope and how to get through loss and I know that's going to be really wonderful for you guys. So I actually have to go to work now. I'm so sorry I didn't get to all of your questions. Love you guys. And I hope to see you again next week. Take care. Bye.